Ready for the word? Yes. All right. I got one more, one more uh, time I'm going to share with you about uh, uh, being powerful people. And uh, I uh, just uh, keep finding more that I w I'm, I'm still discovering more and learning more and more that I want to say and more that I want to share. So again, I'm, as I'm sharing some of this stuff, I'm not in my comfort zone uh, in terms of some stuff I share because it's like already just greatly a part of me and I flow very easily in it and, you know, don't even have to think about it. Uh, this, this particular stuff I'm learning as I go too, I'm embracing a lot more stuff, so I'm, I'm not really in my comfort zone here. So I keep looking at my notes and writing down my thoughts and I'll just share them with you. And that's okay, right? Because we're a family, all right. So uh, one more week on this. I just, I felt like there was just more I wanted to share. And I know that it's helping some of you. I know that, I hear that, and I can see that. <laughs> you know, I don't know if everybody loves it, but I know it's helping some of you. So, all right, let's do, let's do one more. I wanted to really focus more on communication, powerful communication for powerful people. Uh, but let's start in Matthew 28, 16 to 20. And uh, familiar verse, but on the, after the resurrection, it said the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And uh, then when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. They didn't really believe that he had risen. But uh, then, they, then they understood that he had. But Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. All right. So one of the things that... Uh, just jump back to 19, if you would, for a second, please. The reason I'm reading this verse right now is, is because I want to talk about uh, powerful communication, again, for powerful people. So we've really been hitting the idea of becoming a powerful person, right? Core training, Jesus living inside of you, right? And uh, building up that relationship inside of you, not looking for your strength or your happiness or anything else outside of yourself, but it's Jesus inside, right? And then we're the ones who, as we grow more powerful on the inside, become powerful people. We're the ones who change the atmosphere. We're the one who brings change to situations and relationships and all kinds of things, right? And uh, I know it's, uh, I know it's uh, not as easy as it sounds. It's a growth process, right? And there's a lot of challenges, but we're up for it. Uh, but I, I want to talk more about communication principles too, because I just really want us to be good at this. Really, really good at this. And, and in this particular uh, thing, Jesus basically gave us this command or this assignment. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Let's just take that part right there. So what does that really mean? Can you wrap your head around that for a sec? Go and make disciples of all nations. He's talking about the world, isn't he? And he's talking about radically changing people's lives, their belief systems, the way they think, the way they live, their value systems, <laughs> things they do with their time and their resources, and how, right? He's talking about radically changing the world, right? And I know that there's pushback and I know that not everybody accepts and you know, I know that there's spiritual warfare involved and all kinds of stuff. But what he didn't say is just go and build churches and have nice meetings, yeah. right? He said, be powerful people. It wasn't Jesus a powerful person? Yes. Clearly, yeah. I mean, everywhere he went, he brought influence. Love him or hate him, right? Very few people were indifferent to him. I mean, he, he got a reaction, right, didn't he? And some people gave everything to follow him, right? Just laid down their lives to follow Jesus. A very powerful person. Obviously, he's God incarnate, right? And when I say he's be we're becoming powerful people, I don't mean that we're like, in that sense. However, uh, what is he telling us to do there? Is he, he's saying, disciples, go and change nations, disciple nations. Is he just saying, teach them your religion? Is he, just telling them teach, is he just saying, go out and teach people to obey a set of rules? Or is he saying, disciples, reproduce disciples the way I made you, right? He made them to be powerful people, right? He made them to believe that they could change the world and that they could empower each other and empower others, right? And they could bring this, that they could radically change the world. Right? He's making powerful people. He's not, just, he's not just raising up people that follow a set of rules or adopt a religion. Amen, right? And so if he's causing people to become powerful people, then that's, that's really the assignment is become a powerful person and then go into the world with Jesus and his message and his love and his presence and make more powerful people, right? Make more world changers, make more people who, right? You, right, are the agents of change. And so this is really a much bigger thing than just transmit your religion to somebody else, build buildings and have meetings or, you know, tell people here are the rules you're supposed to follow. 
this is powerful stuff that he's, that he's trying to accomplish, and he is accomplishing it. Amen. Um, he's, he's teaching people how to live powerfully, how to love powerfully, and how to lead powerfully. Amen? Amen. <laughs> All right. And so I think that's exciting, right? It's exciting. If he just said, go and transmit this religion and tell people here are the rules, uh, I, I would have checked out of that a long time ago. Quite honestly, you know, I mean, but he said, change the world, right? I'm like, ooh, <laughs> you know, I can change part of it, right? I can do my part. I think that's exciting. And we do it as a, as a team and we do it individually, and, but it's, it's awesome. Now, as I, as I, wanna, I wanna go into some of the uh, um, communication principles in here in just a minute, but uh, let me give the disclaimer again. Almost every time I talk about something like this, like, like every week I talk with probably half a dozen people in some counseling session or some advice or some something, right? Or, and so people always say, did you say that because of me? The answer is always no. It's always no. I never, never, never do that, I promise you. <laughs> All right? I ask God, <laughs> what do you want me to share, right? That's what I share. So it's not because I have some personal knowledge of anything you're going through or anything like that, okay? I always want to say that because it's absolutely true. And people always think that, <laughs> right? Uh, so let me first of all give you some more definition or description of powerful people. I'm just going to read my notes here because, like I said, I'm not in my comfort zone with this yet. Uh, still learning. Uh, powerful people believe that they are equipped and empowered by God to live successfully, to build strong, healthy relationships, and to positively change and influence the world around them. How's that for a working definition? Hey? You're empowered by God to live successfully. You believe it, right? And to, yeah, and to build healthy and strong relationships in family and friends and ministry and everything else. And, and then to bring, to change the world, to bring positive change and positive influence uh, to the world around you. If you're embracing that, uh, you're a powerful person. Again, doesn't mean you need a pulpit, doesn't mean, you know, God sends you to a country somewhere. It just means in your daily life, you're a powerful person. <laughs> right, and you're an example of Jesus living inside of you and what that does. Uh, Here's, here's a couple of other descriptions of powerful people, because I'm trying to get us to wrap our head around what I mean by powerful person. I'm not sure I've defined it well enough yet. Uh, powerful people, here's, I'm gonna give you nine things. Uh, I, I tried to get on the screen, but I didn't, I didn't have time to do it, so I'll just give it to you. Uh, powerful people never, never, never choose victim status. All right. If you're a powerful person, you never, never, never identify yourself as a victim in your thinking, in your speech, uh, in any other way, right? You just don't. You're allergic to it. You hate it. You don't want to go there. You don't want to be that. Uh, I'm not going to be a victim. All right. Uh, number two, powerful people choose to work on solutions rather than simply pointing out problems. Amen. There's always problems, isn't there? Always, always, always problems, conflicts, issues, always going to happen. Powerful people choose to work on solutions. Uh, it's, it's pretty easy to, to point out problems, isn't it? I mean, that, that's, yeah, we, we can all do that. Uh, but we work on solutions. And win-win solutions are always best. You can't always have a win-win solution, but if you can, that's what you go for. It's always the goal, it's always what you want, right? Uh, so, number three, uh, powerful people believe that they have the power to make all of their relationships better. Eh? We're not, again, we're not victims. If I'm, if I'm just identifying as a victim, what that means by definition almost is I don't have the power to change anything. I don't have the power to make anything better. I just, I don't have that ability. I don't have that choice. It's not up to me. I'm a victim. Uh, and, uh, and then all I can do, if you're a victim, really all you can do is complain, isn't that right? And I heard uh, one preacher say one time that complaining is the language of slavery. And I just went, ooh, <laughs> right? it's just, it just really is. Right? So if you're a powerful person, uh, you know, we, we, we move away from complaining and away from victim status, and uh, we believe that we have the power to make any relationship better. Uh, number four, powerful people believe that they have the calling and the power from God to make their future better and to make our future better together. Right? If you're a marriage or a family or whatever, or a church or a friendship, we have the power from God to make our future better. And if, we don't have that, if we don't have that ability, then we're just victims again, aren't we? It's just fate and we have no, you know, nothing we can do. But powerful people believe that we are equipped, we are empowered by God to have better futures. Again, this, the power is not ours, is it? It's God, it's Jesus living in us, but he does empower us, amen? And we do become powerful people. Uh, and that's, that's really a mark of powerful people, though, is the, just the idea of hope. When you think about your future in any way, do you see it as getting better 
Okay? Or do you see it as no change or maybe getting worse? Okay? And so if you can see your future getting better and you believe that God has empowered you for that, that's a powerful belief system right there. Amen. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, number five, powerful people include rather than exclude. Uh, and in other words, they draw bigger circles rather than smaller circles. Does that make sense at all? You include more people. If you're a powerful person, you're looking to include more people in your life, in your love circle, in your friendship circle, in your influence circle. Bring people in. Okay? If you're not a powerful person, what we do is we tend to exclude people. We draw smaller circles and smaller circles. I'm making my circle smaller and you're out. And now my circle's smaller and you're out. Right? And, uh, but if you're a powerful person, you, make, you keep drawing your circle bigger. You're in. You're in. <laughs> you're my friend. Right? I want to influence you. I want to know you. Right? I want to... Right? And so... It's a, very, it's a very powerful thing to do. Uh, powerful people, number six, all, powerful people always choose to love more rather than less. They turn their love on. And, uh, and we go through that choice all the time. When we have conflicts, when we get hurt, when we get angry, when we get disappointed, when we get, you know, whatever it may be, misunderstandings, uh, the choice is immediately, do I love less or do I love more? And powerful people choose to love more. They turn, they turn their love on and they keep it on. Right? I'm going to love more uh, to change this situation, to make this situation better. I believe that as a powerful person, I can turn my love on and it'll get better. Uh, number seven, powerful people live by God's vision. Uh, again, that's similar to having hope for the future, but it's more specific. Uh, God's vision means I have an idea from God what my relationships can look like, maybe they don't now, but what they can become, right? What my marriage, my family can become, what my friendships can become, what my influence can become, what my, my professional life can become, whatever it may be, right? We have a vision from God, and that's what empowers, right, our belief that, that we can get better, that, uh, that our future can be better, and that our relationships can be better. Uh, all right, number eight, uh, powerful people are unoffendable by choice. <laughs> Unoffendable by choice. And uh, do I really have a choice? You do, you do, and I know that sometimes it's hard. I get that. But you do, right? We do have that choice. And uh, here's a key though. You can only be offended by people that you perceive as being more powerful than yourself. I don't know if you got that. You can only be offended by people that you see them as being more powerful than you see yourself. So if you see the powers outside of yourself, other people are greater, superior, more important, more, more influence, more power in your life, then it's easy to get offended. But if you don't see yourself as a victim in any way, I'm a powerful person, I can make relationships better, I can work towards solutions, I can communicate powerfully, clearly, directly, right? And when you see yourself in that way, right, uh, you just choose to become unoffend unoffendable. Okay? And, and I know from experience that when you choose to be unoffended, you're unstuck. You just, you just keep going forward. You keep moving forward. Anytime we get offended, we get stuck. Uh, amen. Number nine, powerful people choose to engage or fight rather than withdraw. And when I say fight, you, don't, you know I don't mean argue and bicker and carry on, right? When I say engage and fight, I mean fight what's wrong and make it right, right? I mean go after solutions, go after things to get better, confront things that need to be changed. Choose, powerful people choose to engage. Uh, rather than withdraw. When we withdraw, right, what we're really saying is I can't or I won't deal with it, I don't want to, I'm afraid of it, uh, you know, whatever it may be, and uh, I'm, I'm checking out. It's not a powerful decision, but powerful, powerful people engage and they, they take things on. They do pick their battles purposefully though, right? You don't fight everything. You fight battles that matter, things that matter. Most of the battles that you will choose, hopefully, are not found on Facebook. <laughs> Can I just say that? <laughs> don't fight all your battles on Facebook. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it's just, it's just, yeah, just don't bother. Don't bother at all. The, the real battles that are worth picking are found in living for Jesus and how you're going to influence people, right? And change people, your life and other people's lives in a positive way by being a powerful person. That's, that's the fights we take on. Amen. All right. Uh, Anyway, does that, does that help anybody just get a better definition of what I'm talking about when I say a powerful person? Okay, yeah, you know, I'm not talking about Superman, you know, stopping a train with your hand. I'm just, I'm talking about living, 
powerfully. <laughs> All right. Uh, and that's what Jesus called us to do. Go into, the, in the, uh, go into the world and make disciples of nations. If, if, you don't, if you can't embrace the idea of becoming a powerful person and you even try to understand what Jesus is saying there, it's impossible, right? It's just impossible. But if, if you can conceive of the fact that he is the most powerful person, obviously, and he's empowering us, Right? Not to transmit our religion, not to tell people a set of rules, but to become powerful people with Christ living in us and then help other people become powerful people also. And, and all that that means, all the, all the principles that go with that, right? Then this is exciting, right? This is a lifelong challenge. Uh, go to Ephesians 4, uh, 15. And so this passage, uh, I could read the whole context, but I, I don't think I will. The, the, but the, I'll just tell you, the, the context here in Ephesians 4, um, some of you are familiar with it. It's talking about, you know, that, that Jesus put into the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers to equip the saints, train the saints, strengthen the saints, right? Because the saints are the ones called to do the work of the ministry, right? And so it's talking about that in context. Uh, and it's talking about the church growing up, not being babies, you know, but the church growing up and becoming mature and strong. And then it says that we are to learn to speak the truth in love and grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. So the goal is we're going to grow up and become more and more like Jesus. Uh, but one of, the, one of the marks of that is speaking the truth in love. And God just really drew my attention to this today, uh, this particular principle, because when we talk about powerful, powerful communication for powerful people, here it is. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> that is the verse. That is the key right there. Speaking the truth in love. <laughs> now, uh, this, I mean, this is a guideline and a principle for all, all, all powerful communication. But there's two goals here. There's two steps. There's two parts. The first part, speaking the truth, right? The second part is speaking the truth in love. And those are two separate things. They, they're supposed to go together, but these are two separate, like, uh, goals to accomplish here, two things to wrap your head around. Um, and so you're not really at the finish line or the goal until you're speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth by itself can actually be harmful. What? It can actually be damaging. Uh, how could that possibly be? I'll show you in a minute, but let's keep going. Um, so speaking the truth, uh, that means saying what needs to be said. If you're a powerful person and you believe that you have the power to improve relationships, you have the power to fix problems, you have the power to make things better, right? You, uh, you become a person who communicates truth and you say what needs to be said. Amen? <laughs> you address problems when it is actually your business. Stuff that's not your business, leave it alone. <laughs> Just leave it alone, right? But when it's your business and it matters to you and it's something you're involved in and you have a place in in some way, address problems and say what needs to be said. Um, the opposite of that would be chickening out, running away, or power, powerlessly blaming others from a distance. Now, that's an easy thing to do. How many have done that? Fess up. You distance yourself and just point out who did what wrong. I'm standing at a distance diagnosing what everybody did wrong. I'm pretty smart. I can tell what everybody did wrong. <laughs> it's not a powerful thing to do, though, is it? A powerful thing to do is engage problems communicate powerfully, believe that you have the power to change things, to make relationships better, and all of that. Uh, why don't we sometimes speak the truth? Uh, sometime, for, for a lot of people, again, how many, how many are conflict averse? I mean, you just don't like conflicts. You don't like it. You don't like, you don't like to say something to somebody that might be unpleasant, negative, uncomfortable, <laughs> just don't like to do it, right? Me too. <laughs> me too. That was one of those things, again, where like, God, why did you call me to be a pastor and a leader? Could you have picked anybody else for this? <laughs> because I don't like to do that. <laughs> so, and then God would say, I'm calling you to do that. <laughs> anyway, um, so why don't, why, don't we, why don't we like to speak the truth? Many of us, at least. Um, you might, if, I, if, I, if I speak the truth, you might not like me. You might reject me. You might get mad. Maybe, I might be wrong. It might turn out to be wrong. Um, if I'm going to tell you the truth, um, my anxiety level spikes up. Anybody relate? You're going to talk to somebody and your anxiety level goes, whew, right? And so you just back off and go, I'm just not going to do that. 
<laughs> I'll just let it be. <laughs> right? I can't deal with the anxiety level at that, at that level. Right? Um, or maybe if you don't tell the truth because maybe nothing will change and that will confirm that the other person doesn't actually even care about you. Okay? And so all of those things, you don't like me, you might reject me, you might get mad, my anxiety goes up, or maybe nothing, maybe it won't do any good. Anybody? <laughs> right? if, yeah, we've, we've turned away from speaking truth and saying things that need to be said be, for those reasons. Everybody got Okay, all right. Uh, pretty much most of us. All right. so, so the first kind of goal in powerful communication for powerful people is just simply deciding to speak the truth, right? I'm just going to say what needs to be said. I'm going to address this. I may not do it beautifully. I may not do it eloquently. I may not do it diplomatically, but I got to open my mouth. I got to say something, right? All right, and that's a good step. It's a good first step. All right, um, always a good first step. Uh, but then, even if, if you do manage to open your mouth and say something, um, that's not the finish line yet because the rest of the verse says speaking the truth in love. <laughs> well, and that's where it gets a little trickier, <laughs> right? Yeah, some people have no problem speaking the truth. I just say what I think all the time. I don't care. All right. That's a minority of people, but some people uh, kind of are good at that. But for most of us, uh, speaking truth is difficult enough. But now, the real goal is speaking the truth in love. And what, how, do, how do you define that? If you're, how do you know if you're speaking the truth in love? Uh, because, uh, for one thing, you're believing the best about the other person. Whoever you're talking to, you're believing the best about them. Uh, and you're wanting the best for them. Okay? That's the test. If I'm believing the best about, I know that I'm addressing a problem, right? So there's a problem. But I'm still believing the best about your heart, your motives, your soul, who you are. I'm believing the best about you. And I want the best for you. And if you can kind of check both of those boxes uh, right off the bat, you're probably in the right territory. You're speaking in love, right? Uh, you want a win-win such a uh, win-win solution rather than a win-lose solution. Win-win solutions, right, where everybody gets better, everybody gets blessed, everybody, you know, comes out good in this. And win-win solutions are love, and that's what we want, right? Win-lose solution is when we say, this is a competition and I gotta win. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be up here and you're gonna be down here when this is over, ha, 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 somehow. And we don't, that's not love, and it's, it's not God's way. However, you can't always have a win-win, can you? Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you can't, but you try, you try. You're speaking the truth in love if you're considering the other person's feelings. There's a shocker. <laughs> if, if you consider their feelings, how you say what you say, and you're considering what problems they may be facing, what they may be going through right now, um, if, that, if you think about that and that matters to you, you're probably in love, you're probably in good territory. If you don't care what they feel, you don't care what effect you have, you just blah, um, then you got some work to do there. Uh, we also, when we speak truth, uh, we consider the other person's level of growth and maturity and what they are dealing with right now. Uh, I'll, I'll just give you an example, and I don't even know if it's a good example, but, <laughs> but it's an example anyway. <laughs> when, uh, when, you know, when I first got saved, I made, uh, you know, made it real, uh, real clear that I got saved in Alcoholics Anonymous, right? And, f and I came out of uh, alcoholism, and, and I'm in AA, and I had some friends that were Christians, and they're witnessing to me, and the sh long story short, they got me, you know, ultimately. They, they, they got me. And so me and a bunch of my friends, we became Christians back in those days in, in AA. We were all, you know, alcoholics trying to get sober, stay sober. And, and so we had genuinely accepted Jesus and we were pursuing Jesus. However, if you had listened to a lot of our conversations at that time, you would have been really confused <laughs> because we talked like sailors. We used every four-letter word you could possibly think of and invented more besides that. We used those words as adjectives and adverbs and nouns and verbs and everything else. And, and we're smoking away and, you know, and <laughs> drinking gallons of coffee and we'd sit in, you know, Denny's or whatever after a meeting and we'd, you know, and if you'd heard us, you would have not identified us as Christians, particularly, except for the fact that we were also talking about Jesus. We're like, we're excited about Jesus. And then, bleep, 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 you know, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> that's where we were. That's just what we were coming from, you know, and we weren't like church guys, you know, at all. Now, nowadays, I tend not to like most of those words, you know. Uh, tend to dislike them a lot. However, I do understand when somebody's coming out of, you know, the world and they're coming to Christ, uh, that's not something that changes right away, right? It's not something there. It's even on the radar, right? And so if we jump on that, I'm just saying, in order, what's, what's important to talk about? What's important to, if, what's really the issue now, right? Do we want to jump on every detail? No. Absolutely not. When I'm working with somebody that's a new believer and they're coming out of darkness and, you know, and they still talk like that or whatever, you know what I do? I ignore it. 
<laughs> I ignore it <laughs> because we're just gonna go for what matters, right? We're gonna go after the bigger things right now. And so all I'm saying is, when we speak the truth in love, uh, one of the things right now, we're considering another person's level of growth and maturity. Where are they at right now? What really matters right now to talk about, to deal with, right? Some stuff just isn't on the radar yet. It might be a year from now, but it ain't now. That makes sense? <laughs> all right, all right. Um, anyway, uh, so why don't we sometimes speak the truth in love? I already talked about why we might have trouble speaking the truth at all, but speaking the truth in love uh, that might be hard because I'm offended. Again, and it's all about me. If I'm offended, I'm having a pretty hard time speaking in love, aren't I? What, what's going to come out is maybe anger, bitterness, you know, something like that. Uh, but powerful people choose to be unoffendable, right? And uh, go for solutions. Uh, or if I'm hurt and angry, it's kind of the same thing. But if I'm hurt or angry and I want to hurt you back, I want to punish you, I want to teach you a lesson in some way, may not even consciously think it through that way, but everybody know what I'm talking about? You're hurt, you're mad, I'm gonna teach you a lesson, punish you, and make you feel what I feel, right? And it doesn't come out in love, does it? <laughs> it absolutely does not. Uh, but that's, that's what God is asking us to do. Uh, another, another possible reason that uh, I don't speak the truth in love is maybe I just like to be right. And being right is so important to me that, oh well, Everybody else is wrong and I'm right. And, uh, or maybe uh, I'm afraid of you. Maybe I don't speak the truth in love because I'm afraid of you. Again, I might see you as a more powerful person than myself. I'm intimidated by you and I can't talk to you in love because I'm actually afraid of you. Does that make sense? I, I hear people say that to me sometimes. They're like, well, Pastor Mike, I wanted to say this to you, but I was afraid of you. I was like, and, I, and, I, and honestly, I think, what? Why would you possibly be afraid of me? You know? <laughs> you know, and then I realize, oh, it's, maybe it's not about me. Maybe it's about how you feel about yourself. Because I'm not like an angry person, you know. If you tell me there's a problem, I will go, oh, I want, let's, let's talk about it, right? Let's talk about it, you know. Uh, I mean, I can, I'm human, <laughs> you know, but, but uh, well, let's talk about it. All right. So, uh, anyway, the, the real goal is speaking the truth. How? <laughs> In love, there we go. When you can do those two things, just that right there, you become a powerful person. <laughs> become a powerful person. And if you were to just diagnose yourself right now, no, let's do this one. <laughs> I just want to see if it works. How many would admit that you have trouble just speaking the truth? That that alone is hard for you, <laughs> okay? How many can say, I, I, I can speak the truth, but speaking it in love is, is, a big, is kind of <laughs> tough for me. All right, I got a few of you there, all right. The rest, how many are not gonna raise your hand for none of that, no matter what I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't ask me to do that, and I'm gonna do it, okay. <laughs> all right, uh, 1 Corinthians 8, one through three. There's this cool little verse uh, where Paul, the Apostle Paul is writing this, and he's talking about questions that the believers had about meat that's been sacrificed to idols. We don't have to worry about that today. That's not a thing in our culture. But in their culture, animals were sacrificed to idols and then they were offered on the meat market. And Christians were saying, what do we do about that, right? And, uh, and Paul was basically saying, you know, if you know that it's been sacrificed to an idol, don't eat it. But he goes, it really wouldn't hurt you. It's just meat, you know. Uh, on the other hand, because of conscience sake, because somebody might be watching, because, you know, for various reasons. He said, you, you, don't want to, you don't want to eat meat that you know has been sacrificed to idols because it could be a stumbling block to somebody else. It could be, it could offend your own conscience. And anyway, so he explains the whole situation, but here's what he says. Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Oh, that's interesting. Let's just read two and three and then go back. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet, as he ought to know. That's an interesting one. If you think you know all the answers, uh, you might be a know-it-all, but you might not really know what you think you know. And if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. All right, jump back to verse 1. So what he's, he's addressing those two things again, you know, speaking the truth, but speaking the truth in love. And he says, uh, we all have knowledge, but knowledge by itself, this is where I said earlier, speaking the truth without love can actually harm, even though it's truth, because truth can be used as a club over somebody's head, can it? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, 
So the fact that we might be right or knowledgeable about something or be speaking the truth is not necessarily all the way to the finish line uh, because knowledge can puff up. That means it just makes us proud. It makes us arrogant. It makes us a know-it-all, you know. But it says, but love is always edifying. Love is always considering the other person. How do I strengthen them, empower them, you know, lift them up, help them, set them free? And so if you've got the love working with your truth, you're a powerful person. <laughs> you're a powerful person. That's good, huh? Yeah, all right. The crowd goes wild. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let, me, let me read through one more kind of a list here. There's a few scriptures that go with it. Uh, powerful relationship fixers. I, I mentioned this, I don't know if I, if I said it last Saturday, but I know I said it on Sunday, and it just kind of came out of my mouth without planning it. Uh, but, I, uh, but I really started to think about it more and more. Uh, so powerful relationship fixers. Uh, this is what I said last week. Sometimes the powerful thing to do is forgive and let something go because it doesn't matter. Sometimes the powerful thing to do is to confront because it does matter. Sometimes the powerful thing to do is to talk and listen until you connect hearts and you understand each other. <laughs> Did I say that last Saturday? I don't know. I know I said it Sunday. It just came out of my mouth and I, and I went, oh, wow. Okay, that's pretty good. Uh, let, me, let me repeat that. Start, uh, use Matthew 18, 20, 21, 22 though. Because there's, there's a menu of things to do here, and it's, you have to decide which is the right thing to do based on the circumstances. Uh, Peter asked Jesus, said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times, thinking he's being very generous. Okay? And let's see, 22. Oh. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Okay? And so... Uh, this is sometimes the powerful thing to do is forgive and just let something go because it just doesn't matter. <laughs> or because there's other things that matter more and we're not there yet. <laughs> Again, you know, talking about you know, using all the four-letter words before you're, you're at the place where, okay, that even matters to me now. Uh, and so that was a terrible example, but it's the best I could come up with. Sorry. So... How many, how many understand, sometimes the powerful thing to do, just forgive something and just let it go, right? There's little irritations. We all irritate each other, don't we? We all have our little things, even the person you're married to, your peace and people in your family, close friends. We all have little things that are just irritating. It's like, really? Really? <laughs> right? <laughs> and, uh, and the powerful thing to do usually is just absolutely ignore it. Just let it go and forgive it. And it just doesn't matter. Don't pick on it, don't bring it up, don't mention it, just let it go. Most of the time, right? Little stuff, little stuff, absolutely. Powerful thing to do, it really is. We forgive stuff all the time and, and hopefully people forgive me all the time little things that I never know about because they don't matter. <laughs> but sometimes the powerful thing to do is to confront because it does matter. It does matter, right? And that, that one is, it's also Matthew uh, 18, but it's verse 15. It's in the same chapter. Uh, Jesus did say, moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone, right? And if he hears you, you've gained your brother. So this is the instance where sometimes the powerful thing to do is to confront something and talk about it because it matters and it matters now. And if you run away from it, it's not a powerful thing. But if, you're, if you can do this, it's a powerful, you're a powerful person communicating powerfully. But again, you have to decide what matters, what doesn't, <laughs> right? Um, and then sometimes the powerful thing to do, I got no scripture up there, but it's still true. Sometimes the powerful thing to do is simply sit with somebody and talk and listen and talk and listen and talk and listen until you connect hearts and you understand each other. And that changes everything. <laughs> it's like, I just didn't know where you were coming from. I was judging you. I was misjudging you, right? And uh, I thought you were trying to do this, or I thought you were thinking that. And, and I've, I've found just 99 out of 100 times when people will sit and, and talk and get to know each other's heart a little bit, they'll go, oh, I misjudged you. I'm sorry. Oh, I misjudged you too. I'm sorry. <laughs> right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? There? Yeah, absolutely. Anybody ever had arguments with people in your heads that you never had out loud with them? <laughs> Right? Right? Oh, I got a good reaction on that one. Everybody went, yeah, yeah. <laughs> really seriously, right? 
<laughs> and you know what? You know what that is? You've already got some offense where you think that this, you said this because you did this because right, and you think you know and you don't, right? and you have an argument with them in, their, in your head, and it never happens in real life, but you're already mad, right? <laughs> <laughs> in fact, you might think it, it was real after a while. Like, we really had that conversation. <laughs> if you, most of the time, if you talk to somebody, connect hearts, and understand each other, it changes everything. Then, actually, you can support somebody in something. Maybe they already know they're struggling with something. You can be a support to them, right? All right. So those three things, you just take that little simple menu, and it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. Sometimes the powerful, powerful thing to do is forgive and let it go because it doesn't matter. Sometimes the powerful thing to do is to confront because it does matter, and it matters now. Sometimes the powerful thing to do is talk and listen until you understand. Uh, I'll give you one more, one more verse. Uh, oh, let's take maybe, maybe five more minutes. Ephesians four twenty nine. Uh, when we're talking about powerful communication, Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. Uh, this, one, you know, the first half a dozen or dozen times I read that verse, when it said, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, all I thought I was talking about, after I actually started reading the Bible, I thought I was talking about all those four-letter words, like, you know, don't say this word and that word and this other word, right? <laughs> That's what I thought I was talking about. And uh, again, you know, nowadays I tend not to like those words, but that's not what he's talking about. It's not what he's talking about. Because he's contrasting it with let what comes out of your mouth be good for edifying people, building people up, right? That it may impart grace to the... Now that, impart grace, that's a powerful little thing there. Because, again, if you define grace correctly, grace is actually God's divine empowerment for us, isn't it? It's, yeah. Uh, it, grace isn't just get out of jail free. Grace isn't just forgive you and you're forgiven. Grace, actually it says in, in Ephesians there in that chapter, chapter 4, it says that Jesus gave gifts of grace to the church so that people become apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and healers, and prophesiers, and preachers, and, you know, servants, and leaders, and all kinds of things. And all of those things are grace. They're God's measure of grace going into you and upon you that empower you to do what you could not do. They empower you to become what you could not have become. Right? So it's not just get out of jail free. Grace is empowering, divine empowering, divine gifting, divine encouragement, divine, right? And so here what he's saying is if you're, if you're an empowering person and you learn to communicate powerfully, what comes out of your mouth will literally impart grace to people. It will actually empower them and God's spirit, you're speaking God's principles, God's heart, God's word, and God's spirit anoints it and you actually empower people to become greater than they could otherwise. Whew. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's, so, you know, again, the first half a dozen or dozen times I read that, all I thought, all I thought it was saying was talk nice, right? Just talk nice and don't use bad words. That's all I got out of it. <laughs> you know, now what I get out of it is, so much different. You impart grace. You edify. The opposite of that would be, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. What that means is words that are, that are tainted by the devil. Not, not Satan himself, but by demonic nature, which is to disempowering. It's to tear you down. It's to inspire fear, guilt, disconnection, doubt, right? Separation. Whatever it may be, confusion, you know, manipulation, control, whatever it may be, words that have that demonic nature to it, that's what he's talking about. Don't let that stuff come out of your mouth because when people walk away from you and your words have just shredded them somehow or left them, whoa, you know, <laughs> right? This is the powerful stuff. Empowering people impart grace. You literally release God's presence and God's divine empowerment into the people around you. But the cool thing is, if he's telling you to do that, that means you have the ability to do that. With Jesus living inside of you, you are equipped to do that. <laughs> How cool is that, huh? Uh, 
I'll just read my, I'll read my list very, very quickly here. I made just a few more things. Powerful communication is, here, you empower people with your words, okay? Uh, powerful communication is, say what you want and say what you need. Don't make people guess. We talked about that one already, didn't we? Say what you want, tell people what you want, tell people what you need, don't make them guess, don't make them try and read your mind. Don't hold them responsible for not understanding you if you haven't communicated them to you, if you haven't communicated to them, right? Uh, another one, don't use sarcasm. Powerful people do not use sarcasm. God taught me that some years ago. Sarcasm is cowardice to avoid speaking the truth in love. Ouch. <laughs> and I know that because I did that. When I was afraid to speak truth, I would use, use sarcasm. And I had somebody confront me on it, and it hurt. But they were right. Uh, don't be passive aggressive. Powerful people are not passive aggressive. Passive aggressive means I'm passive to your face. To your face, I smile and everything is fine. But the moment your back is turned, I will attack you. That's passive aggressive. We don't have to do that, do we? Because we're powerful people. Uh, we also build a two-way street. Powerful people ask other, what do you want? What do you, what do you need? So if I'm gonna tell you what I want and what I need, right, and I can be that clear with you, and I want you to do the same, right? Powerful people say, what do you want in this relationship? What do you need from me, right? And, and so you build that two-way street, and that's a powerful thing to do, and it's very healthy and it's very strong. Uh, Powerful people measure their words. Uh, if you say too little, that's a problem. If you say too much, that's a problem. <laughs> let, me, let me explain that just for a second. If you say too little, you remember deposits and withdrawals in relationships, right? Okay, if you say too little, it's a withdrawal because what you're really saying is I don't care. I don't want to talk to you, I don't care. Right? However, if you say too much, too many words, too much talking, it's all about me, not about you. That is also a withdrawal, yeah. right? And so powerful people measure their words and they communicate equally and it's a two-way street. I talk, you listen, you talk, I listen, right? If you're not talking, I ask you questions, right? All right, talking in balance is a deposit. It shows you care and you're building a two-way relationship. Uh, powerful people tell people how you value them and how you appreciate them. Uh, now, Again, I had a personal struggle with this. Uh, this was hard for me, telling people I value them and telling people I appreciate them. It was difficult for me. I'm getting better at it, and I'll tell you why. Because I realized at some point that telling people I've, I value you and I appreciate you, that meant that I was the leader. And I wasn't comfortable with the idea that I was the leader yet. <laughs> I just wasn't comfortable with the idea that God called me to be a leader. I didn't see myself as a leader. And so if I said, good job, or I really appreciate you doing that, that was me being, uh, claiming to be a leader. And I felt, or I felt false. And so I couldn't do that. And then once I saw that that was really what was going on, that, that helped a lot. The other thing, though, is that uh, I felt like I, I felt resentful a lot of my life because I didn't get that from anybody else. I didn't get good job. I didn't get appreciate that. And so... I just decided I'm going to do what I, the things I do for self-motivation. Not because anybody is saying good job, but because I want to do it. And so I just decided in my mind that you must be doing the same thing too. So if I was saying good job, that, was mean, that would mean I was insulting you almost. Like you're saying, like you're not doing it for your own motivation, you're doing it for my approval. Does that make sense? Right? Okay. And so for basically those two reasons in my head, I just couldn't utter the words for a long time. Good job. I appreciate that couldn't come out of my mouth. And then when I saw those lies and slew them, <laughs> right, I'm learning to do that, all right? Uh, so again, this is, we're all progressing in this stuff, aren't we? And then uh, powerful people also are transparent. I just did that. <laughs> powerful people are transparent. You're, we're not perfect. We don't claim to be perfect. We don't wear this as a big Halloween mask, right? I'm wonderful in every way. I have no problems. We're, we're, powerful people are transparent. We learn to say, this is where I was wrong, this is where I'm learning, this is where I made a mistake, uh, you know, all those things. Uh, powerful people uh, make promises and keep promises, right? wisely, right? But we make promises and we keep promises. Uh, powerful people set boundaries on our time, and we set boundaries on helping people who are chronic takers. Anybody? Know that one? Yeah, if there's somebody in your life that's a chronic taker, they'll take, 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 and never do anything with it, never give back. Uh, powerful people, it's okay to set boundaries and say no. No, not gonna do it. All right. And uh, 
powerful people also set boundaries on how you allow people to treat you, how you allow people to speak to you. And if people don't know how to treat you or speak to you, as a powerful person, you educate them. On the, on, as the powerful person you are, on how they are to treat you or speak to you, and you enforce your boundaries. There's not a thing wrong with that. Not a thing wrong with that. Okay. Jesus didn't allow anybody to disrespect him. He didn't. Right? I mean, they were, they were mocking and they were crucifying him, but he didn't allow, uh, if you read through the stories, he just didn't allow people to dis disrespect him. It was a very interesting thing. Um, and uh, s powerful people set boundaries on toxic people. People that continually do your damage and they will not self-correct in any way. They will not repent. They will not fix it. They will not stop. Uh, you set boundaries on toxic people and you just say, no, there's a boundary. Sorry. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So those are uh, just a few helpful ideas there. Okay. Let's pray. We stand together and uh, take a moment of prayer and, and just, again, take just two or three minutes here and uh, just position yourself for just a couple of minutes. Let God speak to you. Let God pour into your heart. Holy Spirit, welcome. Thank you that you are leading us into all truth, that you are liberating us and empowering us, transforming us into your image from glory to glory, making us more like Jesus, causing us to grow up in all things into the head who is Christ. Thank you, Lord, you're teaching us to be powerful people living from that place inside of Jesus living inside of us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're teaching us how to communicate powerfully, how to speak truth in love. And just, just for a moment right now, ask, just ask the Lord to, to show you. Again, some of you already recognize it, but just ask the Lord to show you if it's been a, a problem for you to speak truth. If that caused you anxiety or fear or, or you just wanted to avoid it or speaking truth was just hard for you. Or speaking truth in love maybe was hard because you'd get angry or hurt or bitter or offended or afraid or whatever and not not reacting as a powerful person and just ask God to show you if one of those things is a problem area for you to some degree they are for all of us what does God want to say to you there how does he want to change you, transform you, and empower you to be a person who speaks truth in love? What will that look like? Holy Spirit, speak to each person's heart and mind right now, I pray. Show them what it looks like for them to become a more powerful person. Speaking truth in love. God, I also pray that you would pour into each one of us, God, revelation and understanding that we are able, by your spirit in, in us and upon us, we are able to impart grace to people through our words. We are able to divinely empower people around us through our very words because you live inside of us, God. Or we are able to tear people down with destructive words. So let us all be aware, conscious of that ability, of that equipping that you've given us, God. <laughs> the 
Holy Spirit, one more moment. Can we just, just do one thing before we, before we close? Would you pray for somebody next to you? Just, just briefly lay your hand on their shoulder and, or on their back and just say, God, bless them. Right now, God, bless your people. Bless your people. There's people right now that just need a blessing. They just need a touch from God right now. They just need a touch of love, a touch of healing, a touch of relief from pressure or some attack, some oppression. They just need a blessing from God right now. Just release over each one blessing. God bless your people. Strengthen, refresh, breathe on them, Lord. Hallelujah. Bless them, bless them, bless them in Jesus' name. Strengthen them, God. If anybody came in weak, let them leave strengthened. If anybody came in afraid or anxious, let them leave with greater peace, greater clarity, greater faith. If anybody came in hurt or offended in any way, God, let them leave a powerful person full of love and unoffendable. Holy Spirit, minister to your people. Thank you. In Jesus' name.